Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on nano indentation. My name is Rena Samsu, marketing at EAG Laboratories, a Eurofins company. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's event. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Sarah Strowski, Surface Properties Manager at EAG, will be answering some of the questions during the presentation. We will also collect these questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Ilya Herman, Senior Scientist at EAG Laboratories. Hello to everybody, and uh, thank you for checking in on the today's webinar on the Smart Chart webinar series uh, on the topic of nano notation. So, about myself, uh, I'm Ilya, and I'm senior scientist at the Materials Characterization Team at the EAG Laboratories. I'm bringing to the company about, uh, about 20 years of experience in nanomechanical and surface characterization. My background is in physics from Germany with focus on nano in contact mechanics and thin films. I did my postdoc at National Institute of Standards where I worked in dental materials research working on specific fatigue issues on ceramics. Then in uh, more than a decade, I worked as a scientist and engineer at the Center for Tribology slash Brucker, where it was mostly involved in R&D and was responsible for the development of several uh, indentation product lines. Uh, over the last three years, I'm uh, uh, working with EAG and uh, I'm developing the nanomechanical testing business and provide analytical service and atomic force microscopy and nano indentation. So that's an outline of the today's webinar. Uh, so I'm talking first a little bit about the company and the smart chart, followed by fundamentals on nano indentation uh, and application example for, for starting from something simple like hardness and modulus and uh, more, more complex things, uh, as well conclude with strengths and limitations. EAG has several hundred highly educated and experienced employees working around the laboratories around the world. So multiple of the, uh, many of them have PhDs as well. So EAG has um, uh, covers over 40 analytical techniques with nano indentation uh, located uh, uh, kind of available in Sunnyvale uh, in California and Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Our range of equipment and diversity of expertise allows us to provide our clients, uh, our more than 4,000 clients in 50 countries with a comprehensive and peer-reviewed report within a few days of sample received. And if necessary, we can even provide uh, a same-day service. Our company was originally established in 1978, so we've been here for 40 years around and uh, bringing a lot of experience to the table. Let's look at the smart chart. The SMART chart is an acronym for Spectroscopy Microscopy Analytical Resolution Tool. It represents the uh, available techniques at EAG graphically and allowing to easily select suitable techniques based on fundamental metrology characteristics for correct observation problems like spot size and detection limits. The colors are deciphered in the legend here. For example, Dark blue areas uh, provide elemental information, primary, while green uh, areas show information about uh, image, uh, imaging information and red is in between. On the abscissa, we've got uh, uh, the, uh, ranging from angstroms to centimeters. And the vertical axis shows concentrations in atoms per cubic centimeter on the left, as well as atomic concentrations to the right, ranging from parts per trillion to 100%. Now, how to read, in, uh, how to read it? Uh, so, within the box, we can uh, how do you use it? Uh, within the box, we can select a technique based on detection limit, 
uh, we need as well as the area of interest, so the size of the area of interest. Outside the box, those bubbles, they don't really belong quite in this chart. So, but uh, outside the box to the right, those techniques uh, have no localization, but uh, are basically a bulk characterization technique and the sample gets often consumed during analysis. Well, the bottom uh, below the box where we have techniques which have no composition information, but uh, mostly pure imaging techniques. So nanonotation is what we talk in a little bit, a uh, little bit outlier of the exception here. It's not just imaging, and we will be talking more in detail today. So of course, when we make analytical choices, we don't have to forget the z direction. So how sensitive we are. So for example, AFM would be extremely surface sensitive, uh, the very surface, while, uh, for example, nanonotation can be also extremely surface sensitive, but can go all the way deep uh, into the bulk material to get information out of the material. Okay, let's talk about some fundamentals. What is this all about? So it's about mechanical properties. And the uh, question would be, why would you need them? So we need it to, in order to, for example, understand wear behaviors to engineer wear. Uh, then if you have, for example, a uh, failure, like in this uh, dental material, so a crown fails, a ceramic crown, we would like to know why it fails. So we need mechanical properties to describe that, as well as we need to mechanical properties to design and uh, optimize tribological systems. Uh, if we design uh, multi-layer systems like uh, uh, used in semiconductor applications, for example, we need to know the constituent properties to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to make it as uh, with the desired properties. So, and finally, uh, we need uh, we, uh, uh, many applications, they use simulation experiments, uh, for example, finite elements. So there we need also mechanical properties as an uh, input. So we need mechanical properties generally to understand and prevent irreversible deformation. Otherwise, it, it's broken. It doesn't function anymore. So how we do this? So it all starts uh, with, a, with a theoretical uh, foundation uh, uh, in continuum mechanics. So which is uh, there uh, first to translate forces, deformations are expressed in terms of stresses and strains. So then we take into con the constitutive equation, you write this down, we link those both. And we typically, uh, I mean, generally it is developed, uh, uh, the, so the constitutive equation in form of a Taylor development. So it's a tensorial notation. It's, it's quite complex uh, uh, structure. To make it a little bit more handy, it's typically truncated after the first term. And uh, with the elastic tensor here, with, the, with 81 uh, independent components, it's still very unhandy. So for many mechanical characterization problems, a significant uh, uh, simplification is done. It's the limitation to homogeneous isotropic materials. So we have only two elastic constants, the Poisson's ratio and the Young's modulus. So once we have this, we can already design simple experiments. For example, we can uh, have the boundary conditions implemented into, into the sample itself. So uh, we make tensile dog bone samples. With, uh, so we have basically uniform stress so that we can directly relate this uh, elasticity. So we can also go do, um, do bending testing, give us a notch with the goal of a brittle, measure, a brittle property measurement, or can do elastic measurements and materials for acoustic wave uh, sound wave propagation. Um, so we can determine all sorts of properties like Young's models, Poisson's ratio, compression models, shear model loads, yield stress, and fracture toughness. So a lot of properties all along the stress strain curves. And on the microscopic scale, we have no problems for a long time. Now, what, how we deal with when we need to uh, have smaller sample, we need to localize it more. So the, traditionally, we, uh, the hardness testing comes to mind. And uh, it became so successful because it's uh, really simple. Uh, so the concept is applying a load, then removing the load and analyzing the, some characteristics of the residual footprint. For example, the Vickers hardness test takes an imprint and measures diagonals. So it calculates a Vickers hardness number. 
or if we, uh, it's a brittle material, we uh, measure the, the, the length of the crack emanating from the corners of this imprint. So this median radio crack length. So we get a fracture toughness number. So the advantages of a hardness test are simple application. It's applicable to small samples without much sample preparation, and it's fairly easy to scale. So the disadvantages is, if you remember, I mentioned continuum mechanics, pressure, so pressure units. So the hardness, Vickers hardness number, uh, Vickers hardness is a number, and it's uh, a priori difficult to relate to physical properties for that reason alone. So it's limited by imaging resolution. So what we can't see, we can't analyze. And nanonotation was originally developed along with atomic force, with scanning for uh, well, microscopy, scanning for microscopy. So there are, it could be done technically with AFM imaging, but it's slow and it's not really efficient. So it's very limited by the fraction, uh, by the fraction limitations. And uh, yeah, and we can get no elastic properties. What happens during nanonotation testing? So first, we of course have a highly localized inter uh, interaction uh, of a solid stylus with a non-geometry with a solid surface. Then uh, we apply forces. So continuously, we ramp a force and measure deformation simultaneously and obtain, obtain so-called compliance curves. So loading and unloading. So and typically there is a there is a area in between. So there is some hysteresis because there is some energy dissipation going on. So it's a typical elastic plastic indent here. So that's the primary source of information in nanonotation. Now how about scale? So continuum mechanics is scale invariant. So as soon as we forget uh, or neglect the atomistic structure of matter. So we can apply it uh, starting from macroscopic scale. Uh, so when an asteroid impacts the, uh, uh, the moon or so creates the crater. So it's basically the same contact type of test could be described with the same contact mechanics, but with contact radiuses in the kilometer range and megatons and loads. So we can get a little bit lower. So where we get in the analytical uh, uh, kind of uh, realm, so micro indentation, micro hardness testing, getting micrometers, contact sizes at Newton. So it's a, it's still a little, uh, quite destructive. So we can see something. So it's an elastic plastic indent. So we can also do the, apply these contact mechanics to nanoscale, where we have nanometer contacts and nanonewtons. So it's typically done in this atomic force microscope. So it's really non-destructive, and we don't really get plastic properties. Nanonotation fits here. So we capture a little bit of nano to micro. So, and we, we do this uh, over, generally at loads uh, at about in the capillary force range, so about 100 micronewtons, and typical depths range uh, about 100 nanometers. We can capture a wide range of materials such as Young's modulus, hardness, fracture toughness, and we can also get a stress strain curve from indentation. So in all this in the in the mesoscopic on the mesoscopic scale. So when we talk about hardness and modulus, so let me uh, let me introduce you to uh, the most widely new, uh, known method. It's a so-called Oliver and Farr method by the founders uh, Warren Oliver and George Farr. So and uh, because of its importance, uh, yeah, uh, here uh, so. Uh, it was first shown that uh, technically that the unloading curve of this is, uh, uh, is basically there is an elastic recovery it can be measured and repeatable enough so that you can see also that the nonlinear curve. So it's typically first described by a power law, and then we do the differential the derivative of it at the maximum load during unloading in order to get so-called so contact stiffness. Then. Uh, we uh, use contact mechanics to calculate elastic recovery. Elastic recovery means at full contact, we have full conforming uh, 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 bodies. You know? And when we recover, then the outer surface starts uh, basically loses its deformation and also a little bit, uh, the tip also rebounds a little bit. So this contact mechanics takes care of the outside of the contact, the deformation. So we subtract this elastic deformation from the maximum indentation depth and get the so-called contact depth. So this one here. So in, 
if we know the relationship of the projected area of the tip and the distance from the apex, then we can, uh, which we can get through, for example, from a cal tip calibration, we can calculate the, air, uh, the, the area from these depths and use it to calculate Young's modulus through this formalism here, knowing the contact area and the measured contact stiffness. So you may wonder what's the R about. So it's a reduced modulus because we are measuring uh, a priori the deformation of the indentation probe as well as the, surf the surface. So in the date convolute, we need to know the properties of the indentation tip so the pulse length ratio and the Young's modulus, as well as we have to make at least a guess on the pulse length ratio of the sample material. So, and uh, yeah, and the hardness is basically just the quotient of the applied load and the same contact area as used here. Okay, so this uh, methodology is also called quasi-static approach. And here's once more the Newtonian and the volume forces which you evaluate. But uh, uh, another really important uh, methodology to explain it is dynamic mechanic analysis. So here we start from a, from a damped harmonic oscillator model, where we basically find the solution. Uh, so measure the, measure the dynamic stiffness. And uh, so this solution allows us so we measure experimentally uh, uh, the, the phase shift between the load and displacement while we super uh, so we superimpose uh, vibration to an indentation to a loading process and measure the phase shift so from this we can get the real part of the solution is equivalent to the storage modulus and the imaginary part is to the loss modulus so damping so when the hardness is measured very analogous to the quasi-static one using the contact, using just the stiffness from, as a, from the dynamics. Okay, let's talk about instrumentation. So at EAG, we have several instrumentation from Bruco and KLA, and uh, they are generally uh, outlined like uh, something like this. So it's, uh, we have a load frame, now it can be a C frame or a closed loop gantry. We have a sample positioning stage in black and XYZ to position the sample relative to the probe. It's coarsely, coarse positioning. Then we have a transducer where we have a three plate capacitance sensor as the heart of the displacement measurement. So the, the three plate capacitance sensors are technically uh, have the highest uh, dynamic bandwidth uh, to measure displacements, and this is why it's used there so it's a state-of-the-art technology and then we have an actuator on top so the, uh, an actuator so well, our inst one instrument uses the free plate capacitance sensor directly to actuate the transducer and our other instrument uses a voice call mechanism which sits on top both have these pros and cons but uh, work great so and yes and one instrument has also a uh, piezo, uh, uh, piezo translation stage so basically, think of it. It works like an atomic force microscope, but with the with the with the probe replaced by a nano indenter. So which allows us also to do imaging with the same probe, uh, with uh, basically in contact mode imaging mode. So we have testing capabilities uh, to with loads in the range of new million uh, nanonewtons to newtons, as well as displacement ranging from nanometers and millimeters. So that's actual disposal for experiments. So we can do quasi-static and dynamic indentation as well as scratch, uh, some dynamic indentation, property mapping. We can analyze thin films and can deal with, with wear problems. Typically, an experiment starts uh, kind of with looking optically uh, on the sample. So the optical microscope is in line with the indentation system, with the indentation head. And uh, yeah, after an automatic move, uh, to the to the to the indentation head, we can also do a higher resolution image using the tip itself, either profiling, 1D profiling, or a 2D area imaging. So, can be for different purposes to select an area of interest or to study indentation-induced uh, uh, artifacts. So, uh, uh, so we have a, a large range of indentation probes, and we choose them so they are interchangeable, and we choose them depending on the application. 
And we have also a wide range of sample holding fixtures and handling method, as well as at EAG, we have a vast experience and capability to prepare samples, special samples. Yeah, and we can test in various environments at room temperature. So, uh, yeah, and uh, because we just talked about uh, 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 kind of sample uh, conditions, uh, let's talk about samples. So, main condition, uh, one of the main conditions for the samples is, of course, its size. So, we can handle four inch by two by two inches samples approximately at the, at the max side. And uh, if we go to uh, the low end, we can deal with samples of the order of 10 by 10 micrometer size. Uh, if we talk about disc shaped samples or wafer types, we can handle, for example, six inches without problems. Uh, yeah, when we talk about nano notation as a contact technique, surface finish, of course, matters. So the roughness of the sample is important. And ideally, the sample has a mirror finish. No? but we have protocols to handle also rougher samples. But in any case, it's important to have at least an input on the surface finish to have an accurate experimental design. So we can test in various environments ranging from just room, uh, ambient and air, liquids or inert gases, for example, currently at room temperature. Okay, let's talk about application examples. And I will uh, begin with something very simple, hardness and models. So in order to, to design such an experiment, it's very uh, useful to have information about whether it's a ceramic, metal or polymer, as well as some structural parameters, uh, like whether it's a bulk, a thin film, uh, or it's a thin film with very thin, uh, a very thin layer of, of coating on top, whether it's a buried layer of interest, or it's a gradual one. So Let's start with an example on a simple bulk material. So here's an example where we have the load plotted vertically and displacement horizontally and, uh, uh, and several indentation curves uh, here uh, shown. So a range uh, up to 100 micronewtons and displacement up to 40 nanometers. And here's a corresponding uh, uh, in situ image taken with the same indentation probe and where you can see it's actually nine uh, testing done was done at nine surface locations. And those nine surface locations are used to obtain the statistical, uh, so the, the variation, uh, the spot to spot variation of those indentation results. Uh, so, which are used to calculate standard deviation in an average or an average result, as shown here for a few samples. You know? So, for hardness, modulus, and uh, contact depth. So, now, uh, 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 materials are, uh, when, uh, when we start to get thin film, so a heterogeneous material, uh, and uh, we, uh, rule of thumb is uh, we really would like to characterize the film only. We would like to make sure that the elastic recovery is not affected too much by the substrate, so the so-called substrate effect. And uh, in order to take care of it, we either need to know the film thickness, but if we don't have, what we can do is to view a depth profile. So we do basically this, for example, here, a quasi-static test. We load to the peak load, but with subsequent increasing of, so basically we make subsequent steps. And at each step, partial, so-called partial unloading step, we get another hardness modulus value. And then we plot these effective mo uh, modulus and hardness as a function of depth. So, and as you can see here, this is a soft material because uh, soft, uh, soft on hard because the hardness values, uh, values are lower than the one at deeper regions. Now, and the corresponding modulus uh, does pretty much the same thing. The substrate effect just starts earlier. And this is, has a very simple reasons because the elastic field is infinite and the plastic zone it's something which can be clearly uh, sh it's sharply boundaried and uh, we can always uh, relate to whether it's in the film or in the substrate so it's a more or less a sharp transition here okay and yeah and the mechanical properties we could uh, basically take the 10 percent rule the famous one which which uh, works on many materials unfortunately not on all and uh, yeah, we could go either the 10% of the coating thickness and make an average or just take a plateau. For example, here we would uh, be able to do the plateau at about below 20 nanometers. 
Now let me tell. So we uh, uh, we we routinely verify our instrument calibrations as part of an SPC uh, 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 program. So uh, we have the, uh, our processes in place as well as annual calibration checks. But every test comes typically with reference measurements on material which is homogeneous, isotropic, with well-known elastic properties like fused silica. So here's an example where, and we check the Young's modulus, so uh, which has to be uh, remaining constant over the depth area, area of interest. Huh? So now let's uh, give you another example on something very thin. So that's uh, about 40 nanometer silicon oxide on silicon. So it would be an ultra thin, uh, uh, a thin film application. And if we would take the old-fashioned 10% rule, we would be uh, we would need contact depths less than four nanometers. So what does that mean? We we have to get all the repeatability and accuracy on those curves, and of course we have to uh, be able to to yeah to get repeatable results. And here that's a set of curves which are less than these uh, five nanometers, where we can clearly see the loading and the unloading curve, hysteresis in between, and we actually uh, we have special transducers which can go down to uh, down to nanometers contact forces, and this is an image taken 500 five by 500 nanometer field of view, and you see here very nicely that these imprints are visible. These very shallow ones with only a few nanometers. So. This is not a reference material, so it can it can better. And we have done less than uh, one nanometer deep indentations with great repeatability. So far, we kind of looked into a heterogeneity in depth. What about heterogeneity in the surface plane, for example? Well, we could, of course, deal with it. Uh, so atomic force microscopy uh, would be a good way to start. So, for example, peak force Q and M. Uh, it's a technique where at each pixel of an AFM scan, uh, what, what we would do uh, in force displacement curve. So we would, it's a little bit a simplified version of nano annotation, A, because force and displacement sensors are not independent from each other, but it's also because we have so many pixels to handle, we only evaluate two data at two points of the unloading curve. So it's not quite accurate uh, a priori and it's limited to elastic properties. So if we need also hardness, so inelastic properties, then we would already choose nano uh, indentation. So, and as well, if we would want to analyze grain, granular structures or multi-phase materials. So if you have something heterogeneous uh, in the surface plane. So here's an example where in biomaterials, uh, where we uh, make here a topographical scan of, uh, it's, a, it's a tooth, it's a human tooth uh, application, uh, and we look at uh, dental tubules. This is a 30 by 30 micrometer topographic scan, so you see some contrast here, so something is deeper there, that's other tubules, and now we apply about 1500 indents, uh, uh, on a 20 by 20 micrometer area within this field of view, and you can clearly see that the tubules, which are here, uh, they are a little bit more compliant and as well a little bit softer. And we actually see quite a bit more contrast in the hardness than on the elastic properties uh, map. So, several, so they are a little bit softer and more compliant overall. Okay, let's talk a little bit about beyond elastic and plastic brittle, uh, brittle, brittle properties. So uh, fracture toughness is something which describes as the resistance to a crack growth. So at the early stage of, it's not failed yet catastrophically, but the initial part. So the, uh, yeah. And uh, if you design such a test, we would like to know uh, kind of whether it's a bulk materials application or is it maybe even a coating. So and it would also, um, often it's just people want to know a number or uh, others they have just really a failure. So they, they have really cracks and they would like to study it. So uh, yeah, and a simple rule of thumb uh, which can be applied whether brittle or not, whether we should look into this at all is for example, it's uh, looking at the modulus, the hardness range. So materials with uh, E to H over 50, they will unlikely produce any indentation-induced fracture, so it's a ductile 
while materials with less than 20, on the other hand, they will likely fracture. So it's worth to have a shot on these quantities. Now, how this works? So here's an yeah. So first of all, of course, uh, we measure the hardness in the Young's model of the material of interest. Then we make a loading series uh, with increased loads. So in order to see uh, when these cracks appear, so here you start, uh, they start to appear at some place, at some corners, but we are really looking at the configuration, uh, the conditions where we have a fully developed of, uh, system of medium radial corner cracks emanating from the three corners of this tip uh, in this case. So then we can measure the length of those cracks and along with those uh, Young's models and hardness from previous measurement, we can go into fracture mechanics in order to calculate the stress intensity factors. So to characterize the fracture toughness. So, and here's an example for synthetic fused silica given. Okay, so besides, uh, so we looked at quant uh, a lot of calculated properties from nanometation. But there, for example, in atomic force microscopy, uh, we have, for example, uh, a, a very nice way to study, for example, stiction, so the adhesion between the tip and the surface. So we get also the great resolution maps on adhesion. So without using any contact mechanics, just the force measurements, basically, it's like a pull force measurement. So, uh, but if we take a need hardness as well, so it, A, we get this property and we get uh, accounting for stiction makes it, of course, more accurate because we can basically take care of this additional term, in, term of adhesion. So, and we need, uh, we need this uh, specifically if we have very soft and uh, uh, so very viscous elastic materials. So in order to show you uh, uh, how sensitive it is, I have chosen a little bit extreme situations where we use a silicon rubber type material where we use an extremely sharp tip. So, and uh, this is an example where you see when the tip, so this is again the force and displacement as a general form of representation. Uh, we, we start from air and when we are very close to the surface, the, sur the, sample, uh, the sample starts to snapping on the tip. So we can clearly see this. Then we make a full, uh, the, our uh, for a standard force displacement curve where we do we can do contact mechanics, but we also see that uh, we do again a tensile test in the end before it gets back into air. Now let me uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, illustrate it in a different way. So remember this adhesion on the, the adhesion is scaling with radius. Um, yeah, here we are using uh, quite a bit bigger probe. So the cube corner used before is about 50 nanometer radius, and here's a 50 micrometer uh, sphere, uh, radius sphere uh, conical probe. And where we can, uh, we get, of course, much larger adhesion forces up to 15 micronewtons in this case. And uh, yeah, it's a, a very extreme pull force, and it's even greater than the actual indentation load. And this is just, by the way, there are two BDMS plants which I used here, and they have just, we can very clearly differentiate materials with just a megapascal difference. Okay, we previously talked about fracture toughness. So it's more like, uh, it's a cohesive, uh, brittle failure uh, in bulk materials and coatings. So, but we can, we often would like to know also the, uh, the, the toughness of interfaces in a material stock. So we would like to characterize the strength of the adhesion between film and substrate. You know? So we, we can use the scratch resistance test for this. And in order to properly design this, we need to, for parameters like coating thickness, also the elastic and plastic properties of film substrate. Now, how, here is an example of how it uh, works in detail. So, uh, yeah, generally, this, uh, we do a tilt-corrected multipass scratch. What does that mean? So, tilt correction we need because intrinsically, most of these instruments are load controlled. It's by design of the actuator. So, and uh, in order to apply a correct uh, load, we need to uh, take in account the surface profile. So in what, how we do this, before doing the scratch, we actually go to the actual area of interest and make a longitudinal scan with the indentation tip 
with a very small load. So typically, uh, f because for scratch we use fairly large probes, so kind of a few micrometer large probes uh, is normal. Uh, for many applications. So we go into micronutrients, few tens of micronutrients, make a pre-scan, obtain the topography. Then we take the, uh, the topography in account and run the actual uh, loading, uh, loading. So basically, here's the loading profile. So we load, and while we're loading, we move the stage sideways. So the lateral displacement is on the abscissa here in, uh, in this uh, chart. Correspondingly, we measure the displacement. So this would be also the chart where if, for example, a coding failure appears, so this is uh, represented for codings and bulk material. If we have a failure, no, we could already see some uh, phenomena here, so discontinuities. And later on, of course, optically or image by other imaging techniques. So, and we also, after the test, we repeat the scan, uh, the profiling once more at the same trajectory as the original one in order to evaluate uh, geometric properties of the residual footprint longitudinally. And we can also do a transversal scan, so at different positions within the scratch. So for example, here, there's a transversal scan uh, at the half of the scratch length, and we can measure, for example, scratch width and learn also something about the plastic zone underneath through the pile up here. So, okay. Now, uh, yeah, let me uh, give you another example. Uh, often, uh, when we don't know much about the material, about the constituents and structural, uh, so the sizes of constituents, materials involved, and uh, often when the actual application load is not local, but involves the deformation of the whole part. So in this case, the structural stiffness is often sufficient to do any other engineering calculations. So a good example would be a MEMS type uh, application, um, a MEMS device type application or microsprings. Here's an, uh, here's an example where there is a silicon, uh, an edge silicon structure here. It's a beam, it's about several millimeters long and several millimeters wide, about 10 millimeters long and about two millimeters wide. And uh, there, yeah, with fixed boundary conditions. And there we are doing, uh, um, um, for, uh, we are running a load displacement curve, so load, uh, so force, displacement, load, unload, load, unload, it's actually multiple cycles. And it's so precise that we actually don't see any hysteresis. So we can safely say our stiffness is, for example, 970 Newton per meter. Okay, let me summarize. Uh, so, uh, nanonotation is a technique uh, to accurately analyze thin films and small samples. Nanonotation can provide an excellence in specific mechanical properties, an excellent feedback to optimize processing conditions. So, and it's a very good complement, provides very good complementary information to compositional properties, something like Rutherford, uh, what we get from Rutherford backscattering on our secondary ion uh, mass spectroscopy. So, and we also can do fast testing through a high, uh, high level of automation capabilities. On the other hand, uh, to the limitations belongs, of course, samples have limited size. Uh, roughness can impose additional analytical challenges, but which we can handle uh, to some extent. And accuracy depends to a great extent on the input uh, because it's an indirect technique. So the more information we get from you upfront, the more accurate we can design the experiment. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, we talked about nanoindentation. Now, uh, uh, there are other techniques which are very closely related to nanonotation and provide also useful, very useful and complementary information, such as atomic force microscopy. I already mentioned it a few times, so the benefits. So another way to get complementary information is uh, profilometry. Profilometry, I mean, I mentioned already we do tip-based profiling. So stylus profiling, that's what it is. So and with OP, it's much more dedicated on this front for geometric properties. And of course, 
Um, TGA, uh, GC, uh, uh, DTA, and DSC, those are properties which, um, which cover, uh, for example, dynamic mechanical properties and temperature variations. So this is uh, all very close to nanonotation, and there will be other webinars on these uh, topics, and yeah, please stay tuned on this. Okay, so there are let me conclude uh, and uh, uh, yeah there are several reasons uh, to um, to choose AAG but I think it's uh, very important to state uh, right at the top that the client confidentiality is the core of our business. We are a global leader for materials testing service with a broad range of instruments and expertise that leave us poised to take on even the ch most challenging materials and engineering related issues. Finally, in the light of the pandemic that's affecting all of us now, I want to stress that the EAG Laboratories is committed to the safety of our staff and clients worldwide. Um, we've complied with uh, latest uh, regulations from state and local governments, as well as the Centers for Disease Control. Currently, all of our locations throughout the world remain open. And uh, but we uh, but we have limitations on customer visits, and it's it's a fluid situation. Um, but we are operating at the uh, and we are operating uh, uh, our laboratories at reduced capacity. So we can also uh, but we can transfer samples, for example, to other EAG laboratory locations if necessary. So we encourage you to discuss our options with our sales representatives. <clears throat> 